All right, guys. Today we had Mike Salemi on the podcast. Uh, I hung out with this guy in Austin, Texas. He's a fucking legend. Man of his... He's a, he's a true warrior, true king. And uh, we spoke about his uh, world championship kettlebell stuff. We spoke about energy systems and how to remain in that good energy system. We spoke about a lot of cool shit. It was yeah. A like, imagine being a world champion at kettlebells. Right? <laughs> and, and that's hard work, you know? And how he did that and his work around that, his working mm. around that, his work out around that, his nutrition and all these little aspects to, to grow into that person, to pull that off. Uh, working with Paul himself, hanging out, just little tips and gems. And mm. we even went into like what his relationship with Paul was like and what he learned from that, which is, you know, it's, it's learning from your wise men. So it's a really cool guy to, to listen to and good energy, healthy dude. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. yeah. I learned actually, I learned about Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> just keep going. <laughs> I learned about, um, I had the biggest breakthrough at Jiu Jitsu after it. So we're just understanding my nervous system and staying at that 60, 60 to 70%. So for me, it was a game changer. Tune in. again or sightseeing or work stuff or what what do you think all the above one of our dreams is to like we just want to get like a big rv and just kind of like just have accommodation but have the rv and just kind of go like maybe go to new york and then to texas and then i'd love to see like wyoming and utah and that kind of stuff as well so probably just do a big corrective culture yeah. trip. <laughs> and I'd like to just see yeah. the country, man. I just want to see all the the, yeah. the typical things. I want to see see the country. Yeah, I want to definitely want to see Texas and Houston and mm. just wherever you're meant to go, I want to see it all. Yeah. If you were to do that's something my wife and I really want to do. My actually my family's about to move to Boise, Idaho. And Boise, you know, borders is really close to like Montana, Wyoming. Yeah. And there's a stretch from like the top of the US to the bottom in this line. And you would basically hit like something ridiculous, like 15 of the best national parks just Ooh, in this line. That would be If you insane. just like, we've had that dream to take, get, you know, get an RV, get something once our little man's a bit older and just do that whole trip. And you would have like the best from Utah to Idaho to Wyoming to Montana to air, like, you know, depending if you go more in, but Arizona, like all of that is just gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. Fucking and nice. uh, and we got to do a podcast with Paul, man, like in person. <laughs> yeah, like with, with, that's that's what yeah. I, I we'd really have to make do. it a podcast trip, I reckon. Like, yeah, you don't. We just have to just link up with like yourself and just everyone in America. Yeah, that'd be sweet. We could and even do a portable podcast tour. Yeah, maybe that's the plan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exciting. That's how you even further ju- justify it, you know. And, yeah, I mean, there's so many people out here that you guys are just you're already connected with or will connect with, so. Hell Dude, yes. I know. I'm a full yes to that. Man, the friggin' like, I was on the mat at 10th Planet. I'm just rolling and then I look over and Lex Friedman's right next to me. <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> what the fuck's going yeah, that's on? that's crazy. You know, man. it's just like everyone's right there. Yeah. It's, just it's trippy, like one yes. of the biggest podcasts in the world, eh? mm. you know? Like, mm. um, it's trippy. And then and then Joe Rogan's studio is like right there. Oh, really? You saw yeah, it? I didn't see it, but I know it's in the in that in the complex yeah. that we were, we were at. It was cool. Jake was telling me yesterday, there's only like, was it you? The same there's only like three people involved. Yeah, with the Joe Rogan experience, there's only three three staff members because he was saying like you just want to have a team that's just like crazy focused and just small and tight knit. I was thinking that's a that's yeah. a good bit of advice. Mike. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, mm. I was like, all right. Because yeah, Vice Magazine they used to do. You know, it. Someone asked what was wrong with Vice Ma- Magazine, and because uh, it used to be so good, and they're like, man, we just got too big. And there was like hundreds of employees mm. and, and it started to get filtered out and then we kind of lost the soul of it. And I was like, oh, that's a good point. That's mm. a good point. True. Mm. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and just in that that one like radius, like just Austin itself, like there's so many people. Yeah. From jujitsu community to health and wellness community to, I mean, hunting community to mm. <laughs> like, yeah. it's just fit, you know, on it and all those those people to all the specialty stuff. Like you can hit up, that's where, I, you know, it used to be New York for me, pre- pretty much New York, Texas, and California, Nor- NorCal, SoCal. Yeah. Florida, there's some people, like, in the space that we're in, but within those, like, trips, and now it's basically NorCal, SoCal, Austin. Uh, that's really the three that I've condensed it down, yeah. and so if I can say five days, six days, I could be on book out the calendar with connections, podcasts, meetings, and just get, just move the needle really far. But mm. not much travel. Yeah. I can imagine Paul being out in uh, Texas, eh? Because I know he just went out there, but I, I could see him out in the farm out there, eh? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's sick. Well, yeah. we'll roll the podcast anyway. I think we should just roll it from the from when we started talking. So welcome to the Corrective Culture Podcast. Today we have Mike Salemi. Uh, so honored to have you on, man. Me and Callan have both been kind of, you know, fans of your work for a long time since we heard Paul talk about you and, um, you know, being a kettle, kettlebell world champion. I did your course and, and Callan has done a bunch of kettlebell stuff as well. So it's been it's been cool, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's um, it's sick, man. Kettlebell world champion. That's a that's a big <laughs> that's a big thing. A lot of people like to throw kettlebells around, you know. <laughs> it's really how, how did you get the, into that, dude? Like, that's like what what made you specific? I know you're big on the Bulgarian bag too, but like kettlebells, what made you just pick that? You know. So from a competitive standpoint, it started. Um, I mean, when I was a yeah, it pretty much started when I was a collegiate. Well, actually, if, if I go really back to the origin story of it, I imagine you guys are familiar with West Side Barbell and Louis Simmons and all of that stuff from powerlifting. Does that mm, ring a bell? No, nah. not really. I'd he, like to he say he's yes. like the <laughs> he's like the main guy. Um, I mean, he's since passed, honestly, in the last like two years. But oh. he's like the OG, I would say, of uh, the strength world. He owned West Side Barbell. There's a whole Netflix documentary. Uh, Joe Rogan's been out there. And hands down, hands down, the strongest gym in the world. Multiple, wow. multiple, over 1,000-pound squatters, 800, 900-pound deadlifters, 700-plus-pound bench pressers. And this was even when I was 18, so 20 years ago when I was out there for a month training. And he came up, I wouldn't say he came up because a lot of his information um, was taken from the Soviet style of training. So he took translated Russian text, primarily in Olympic weightlifting, and when the Soviet Union was putting so much of their science and their money to beating the Americans on a world stage. And they really, you know, from plyometrics to all the stuff that you guys already know, Louis basically took that and then molded it and modified it and customized it for powerlifting. And so you hear the conjugate method. That's one of the things that he's really big and, and known for, I would say, like furthering. But uh, when I was at his gym training with those guys, so like I'd be in the same rotation as a guy named like Chuck Vogelpohl, you know, just like a fucking beast, yeah. beast, thousand pound squatter, the most intense guy I've ever met. And mo a lot of those guys who went to that gym uh, were, because Chuck, if I recall correctly, he was the fitness, not fitness director, but he was running like the, I don't know, the strength and conditioning at the local prison out there. So you had a lot of inmates coming yeah. through there as they were in the rehab process. And Louie would put up, like this is the most, one of the most generous men I've ever met. Like he do thousand pound or a thousand dollars to, you know, all the guys if they break this record. And so he would really incentivize and get these guys back on their feet. But you're walking in the gym with a whole fucking room of pit bulls. Yeah. Like we're talking to the max. And so I was 18, went out there, wanted to study and learn. <laughs> and then when I was there, that's when I first came across a kettlebell. Now they were doing it super, super basic. It was basically, if I recall correctly, it was 20 years ago, but it was um, swings and bottoms up presses were really the only two or one of the few that I can recall we used. But right away, and at the time I was competing in powerlifting, I was like, damn, like as, I don't want to say they're simple movements, but with those two, immediately I started noticing gains in powerlifting and athleticism. And I was just, I just love the nostalgia of something old, like something that, we hear back, yeah. you know, old, strong, like I loved that cultural piece. Mm. And so I went home and he hooked me up with a guy where I brought all, bought all my kettlebells. And, and then I just studied voraciously and took certifications and I was a collegiate strength and conditioning coach. And so all the benefits of having a portable tool that's very functional that I can take on the courts with my athletes was huge. But then I took a certification, one of many, and the assistant instructors were competitors in kettlebell sport. And so at the end of the certification, they pulled me aside and they're like, dude, I think like you'd be really good at this thing called kettlebell sport, gear of voice sport. And I was like, I had no idea what that was. And I was like, tell me more. And they're basically, they said it's basically Olympic weightlifting with kettlebells done for, for strength endurance for 10 minutes and you can't set the bells down. Now coming from a powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting background, anything more than one to three reps, I was like, oh, what this is like <laughs> out of my league. So I really liked the challenge of it. And then it was a window into me obsessing about a tool that I could immediately see the benefits in athletes in general pop. And I was just like, fuck, 
why the hell not? And that led into just just like every sport, jujitsu or hunting or whatever it is has their own community. I fell in love with the community and I fell in love with this thing that was so goddamn challenging. And um, that was kind of, you know, in a brief way, that was the origin story of it. Wow. Wow. I was just thinking about then. It's also a really good uh, my fascia release tool too. Hey, it <laughs> does a couple of things. Like I feel like nothing gets my upper adductors better than the than the handle of a kettlebell, man. Yeah, nothing. It's like yeah, it's that spot. Fully, yeah. How did um, like I know Paul ended up doing a bit of training with you, and I remember hearing hearing the story. But I think for our listeners, it'd be pretty cool because I know he was pretty strict on like you know making you eat straight away after a workout and what were like some of the real key point takeaways you know when you were training to be a world champion Uh, because you trained with Paul before that didn't you leading up to that did you or yeah so the reason why I went to Paul was so when I was competing in kettlebell sport and this wouldn't just happen in competition but this basically would happen in any hard attempt in the gym so like we don't really use so much like one rep maxes in kettlebell sport right because it's a sub maximal sport even though the bells are seemingly quite heavy, the technique, the breathing rhythm, like there's a lot of things that you can use strategy wise to save mm-hmm. energy. So it's not like a one rep max thing, but anytime I do a hard lift, like it, whatever, let's just say a, a challenging set, all of a sudden my forearm, my left one, and I've got some old pictures of this. I mean, we're looking way back because I went to go see Paul in 2013. So you're looking over 10 years ago is when we started working together for two and a half years. Wow. But like there would be a massive, it was almost like there was um, like a water balloon inflated underneath my form, not like a forearm pump, but it was literally oh. super squishy. It was super big. So I'd experienced this massive fluid filled pouch in my left forearm. And one, it was painful. Like it felt like, like a, like a dull pressurized pain. And then it was compressing the nerves, and so I'd lose all feeling in my left hand. And so, one, I wouldn't want to quit the set, so I'd keep going and keep going. And then, as you guys know, with kettlebells especially, I mean, your grip is the only thing in contact with the bell. Mm -hmm. So if your grip, or with the Bulgarian bag, if your grip goes, the rest of the whole body will start compensating and start changing, and you'll start muscling it, you'll start getting less and less efficient. And so what would end up happening is I'd start just overusing, you know, my traps. I'd start overusing all the muscles that weren't necessarily the most efficient for it. And no one could figure it out. Like I spent over two years going to really good people, all sorts of modalities that that the best I could get a handle of, of, you know, really like this phenomenal rolfer, like an OG rolfer to a fantastic neurosomatic therapist to uh, three different upper cervical chiros to traditional chiros, to upper level check, to, I don't even remember anymore, cranial sacral, like whatever fascial (laughs) workers. And I would get some (laughs) benefit, but like it still didn't resolve the issue. And I was trying to hit master of sport, which is like a black belt and or win the world championship, depending on what time frame we're looking at. And so I was in HLC2. And at the end of the course, when everyone's in line to sign their chi sticks and commit to the gong practice, (laughs) I was like, man, I don't know if I'm going to get this chance again. Because especially like now, Paul's accessibility is infinitely more or has increased compared to 12, 13 Uh, years ago with podcasts, social media. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm. So, but at that time, like there are people from all over the world. I don't even know how many countries and everyone's in line all giddy at the end of the course to get the the Tai Chi ruler signed. And I remember asking him, you know, Paul, uh, I know this time's not appropriate based off of where we're at but I don't know what else to do. Like not too long before that I had competed and I still remember the hotel room that I was at and I just cried fucking all night Mm. because I just kept hitting a wall, kept like within one to five reps, something like that. I'd get close, then have to force the bells down. And I was training, I was eating, I was was doing everything I could, spending money on practitioners, but I just couldn't get resolution. And I was like, well, he's kind of my last chance. And I just know... Paul, uh, like, like my, my experience of him and his work of just, if there's anybody that can solve an insolvable problem, it's him. And then I need to also believe that it's possible. So in that moment, he was the first person of any of them outside of the Czech practitioner that suggested I go see Paul. He was the first person to not promise me that he could quote, fix me. Mm -hmm. And so immediately he had my, well, he already had my respect, but like immediately I was like, whoa, 
knowing what I know about Paul, he was, you know, confident and also humble in mm -hmm. that regard. He's like, I'd have to look through you based off of what you're saying. I've got an idea because he was a motocross racer. Yeah. Right. And so what, so I had a bunch of shit going on, but the expression of it in the forearm was a compartment syndrome. And at the time, my understanding of compartment syndromes primarily happened in runners in the lower body where the mm. fascia can't really expand and blood gets trapped and it causes all sorts of issues. But in motocross, it can happen from the amount of just forearm work that they have to do on the bike. Mm. So he already had a suspicion that's actually what it ended up being. Now, we had to go through a whole process to rebuild that. But to answer your question, Jake, in terms of what was the biggest takeaways, um, there's a lot, man. The <laughs> first thing that jumps out like the first thing actually isn't so like technical or um, I don't know, just isn't like a program design thing or like I learned a lot of sh like a lot of things yeah. working with him for that long and very intense. Yeah. But it was just being in his, in his vibe, like being in his field or just spending time with him. Cause like there's the spoken things and then, but there's also just how I felt myself in his presence and just like really being with a wise man. Mm. Like it was my first interaction, I would say, with a true wise elder. And so a lot of it, I th think and feel, happened via osmosis, just spending time with him and being around and observing. And so that nourishment, I would say, is the biggest takeaway yeah. of him living his principles and being one of the most unique people I've ever, hands down, have met. I think you guys will agree. Yeah. So that's that's the biggest thing is just like his energy as an elder, his transmission, his intuition. You know, I'd come in. I remember um, I took my brother down because I wanted him to meet him for one of the Zen in the Garden stone stacking workshops. And uh, my brother was like, this was when he was in not his current home, but in the last one office in, on Alps Way in um, right by Escondido. And there's a, like a long, long, long driveway. And uh, I remember my brother was on the, I was, I had done my sessions with Paul and then we were going into the workshop. So I think I was crashing there that night and my brother's walking. I don't remember what day he came, day of or day before, but walking all the way across the driveway. So pretty far. And Paul's like, oh, hey, Sebi, your, uh, your Atlas Atlas is subluxed. Uh, you should probably get that checked out. And like yelling that all the way across. And I'm just like, how... Like he just can't switch it off <laughs> and he could like see that from such far a distance while he's moving. And, and I was like, wow. man, this dude's just on another, like, so that's just one example, but I'd show up and it's just like, it's him, you know? And, yeah. and, and I, yeah. So that's, that's probably the biggest thing, but we can certainly go into other things as well. Yeah. That's money. I feel like that on spirit gym is, is exactly the way I feel too. Uh, just the fucking, I'm like, this morning I'm like, yeah, all this all this technical stuff is is sick, but I'm just like downloading so much more than I think think, if that makes sense. <laughs> just by watching the way he's like talking to people and helping people every day. Like he just the, the way he holds himself when he's when he's going in the mental emotional healing with people at the end of every session, which is every week for four or six hours. Like it's just special, man. It's just mm. like it's interesting, eh? Yeah, that is that is pretty cool. Yeah. Man, I'm, I'm curious about um, also that forearm things. I love, <laughs> yeah. I love this shit, right? Because um, it almost sounds like a full intense version of tennis elbow or something. You know what I mean? Like with, with mm. weights almost going that way. Was there something that do you feel like helped the most in that healing process for you? Was there one thing that you're like, oh, that was, mm. that was a bit of a benefit in that, whether that be an exercise or whatnot? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um You know, Paul had said, if one mosquito bites you, you got a classic mosquito bite. But if a thousand mosquito bites, a thousand mosquitoes bite you, you've got malaria. So <laughs> for me, it felt like, I don't know if any one thing, it really just felt, because they were all big things. So I'll give you, I'll give you kind of a list of mm. the things that, and he was able, and this is also what I appreciate about Paul, like every single trip. So I'd go down there once a month for two and a half years, for half a day, sometimes to a day and a half, two days. And so in that time, we would do, usually our flow was pretty similar. Like I'd show up, he would start his day sometimes around 10, 
he'd be up way earlier doing his study and doing all that. But I would arrive nine or 10, make myself at home, go outside, ground down. Uh, we'd start, he'd make an espresso, which obviously he's a huge, like, oh, like fuck. He makes good a damn good espresso. <laughs> it's phenomenal, phenomenal. <laughs> and uh, so good, so good. <laughs> and, um, but then we would just catch up in the kitchen and have, you know, espresso. And because a, a big part, I'm going to share about what the first interaction was but in general, we did a lot, like basically his four, I took his four doctor system and his daily readiness assessment. And then also all the training and volume, what I was doing, it's really cool to look back. Like it's mm. really cool. Cause I was like paying a shit ton of money and also really had a goal and was just super motivated. And I recognize that I may never get this opportunity to work at this level with him. And so I just went all in and that's Fuck also yeah. my nature and my mindset. So I've still got all of the charts of every single day in a Google Doc. I basically tracked four doctors and he gave me some metrics there. The whole daily readiness assessment uh, on musculoskeletal system stress, hormonal stress, um, and then what, what's the what's the last one? It's, it's skipping my brain. Um, um, uh, ment uh, mental, mental and emotional stress or whatever it is, right? And so everything has a numerical value. So I was tracking that every single day for two and a half years plus training volumes. And so before I would go see him after the first trip, this is, and this is how we would monitor during the month. Cause he's Southern Cal. I'm Northern Cal. If you drive, it's like a 10 hour drive. It's not like we're close. Yeah. It's an hour plus flight, but he would look at all of that. And then we would usually touch base via email multiple times a week, or he would write notes in my Google sheet. So he had his hand on the pulse the whole time I was tracking morning heart rate, graphing that, and so he was, even though I'd only see him once a month, like he knew exactly what was going on and would give me coaching and feedback along the way based on, off of those charts. So, but on the first, on normal session, would be we'd have coffee, we would check up on how the prior month went and, you know, for better or for worse, anything that's really present for me. And then we would design a plan for our time together. And so it always, when this is why I really appreciated about it, we always lifted. So mm -hmm. it wasn't just him writing. Like, it's like, no, we were in the gym and he wanted to see my technique. And that's how he, he basically discerned really what it was. He looked at my technique and he's like, okay, I got it. I know what the fuck's going on technique wise, where you're over gassing just from a technical standpoint. And then we, we also tested with hand dynamometer. Mm -hmm. And so to see the difference. And then, so there was a technical issue because what was ended up happening is there was a major imbalance between the phasic prime mover system and the tonic system. So what would happen is, is my, all of my stable, because a 10 minute long set is brutal. Yeah. Going 10 minute clean and jerk with double 32 kilos. And also I competed in five minutes with double 40 kilos. Can't oh. set the bells down. Wow. So Dude, what was happening was, is up. I was so, I was just not, I mean, that's just, that's just a tough event in general for anybody, I would say. But in order to succeed in that, like, yes, you do, like there's technical skill, but there's also, you got to be fucking strong. You got to have endurance. And then your stabilizers, like the nuts and the bolts of the car need to hold the whole frame together. And I would just gas out so early because I didn't do any postural training at all, really. Just, I mean, little stuff, but not nearly to make up for the pattern overload and everything that was going on of how much volume I was doing. So I was just burnt out. One, I was just burnt out to major imbalance. And then so what ended up happening is I was just primarily just using the momentum of the weight and just like letting the bells crash. And then I would use specific, like I'd contort my posture in specific ways to get some rest. Um, so there was a technical mm. issue and that imbalance. But then there was a, like, so I had um, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. True. So he did, he did all the tests for thoracic outlet syndrome. I don't even, you guys would know him better mm -hmm. than me, but like hand up. And so he tested that. Um, I had an atlas axis subluxation. Um, and then there was also a nutritional standpoint. So like when I, w so I had to go off coffee for a while, we would test. And I also had fungal parasites and a bacteria infection a few years before <laughs> that wasn't fully healed. Sure. So we would test things like hand dynamometer uh, before and after drinking espresso and my grip would go down. Fuck. And so the left shoulder and left arm is on the same channel as the stomach. And so that's how he explained like the connection of those two. So 
I don't know how big that was, but it was kind of the combination of all of those insults that led to, and just not having a super balanced training program, you Mm -hmm. know? So all of those things, um, I would say we're all pieces of the puzzle, some more than others at different times. Um, cause I came to him pretty burnt out, you know? So that was like a big thing that we had to do, like really start working on. I think I remember years ago where, where I first heard John a potty with him. This is the, the one bit I remember from it, but, um, where he's like, I gave you the real work and the real work was rest or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Like of knowing, cause it's very easy. Like say, I first got introduced into fitness from, uh, besides like footy back and that back in school, but like CrossFit, when CrossFit was a brand new thing, I would have been like 18 or something. And, um, and I was so disconnected, just training so hard, not being able to walk the next day and then doing it again over and over. But that wasn't even really mentally hard as a young man. It still isn't even today. And it's so easy. It's easy to go train for me. It's easy to go to jiu-jitsu and easy to then go weights and that. But what's hard is like, all right, should I actually go to jiu-jitsu right now? Like, am I, am I tired? Like, oh, I am tired. And that's for the athlete like yourself, that's, uh, that's the work. And that's what stood out to me. I was like, oh yeah, those days that you need to rest when you think you're going to get progressive ahead, it just doesn't work like that. You fucking get tired, you get injured mm. and things, your whole body starts to tighten up and in little, little ways that you would have no idea. So w- did you have a full recovery system in place? Like were you, say when you were training for the, for the worlds, you would, you would obviously have to push that threshold often and, did you have a an intuitive way of calming yourself or did you have like a really structured, okay, these are the mobilizations I'm doing, these are the stretches I'm doing, et cetera? I would say a mix of both. So the first six months, so I'll backtrack one second. So I remember, and I'll never forget this because I also, like a lot of what I would say, I mean, Paul's hands down been the most influential. I've had like really good teachers along the way as of you guys. And I would still say his system, his approach is still the meat and potatoes of everything that I do and that I teach. Um, And he had shared with me like, look, Mike, it's going to take me at least six to nine months to just learn your body for us to really find a groove that works. And like, so he really looking back, he set the expectations really well. He like didn't overpromise at all. And in fact, took even a more conservative approach to that given even his skill set and stuff. Mm. Uh, every time I was in the gym, not only was he watching my technique, technique, but he was training alongside me. And so like, like the respect, the trust, so that, because I, I still believe had as drastic of changes as he was asking me to make from a technique standpoint to, I mean, I got laughed out of a lot of kettlebell competitions in the first phase. Cause people like, especially in the kettlebell world back then, especially they didn't know really who Paul was. And if they did, like, they didn't really it's just like with any culture, it's like, what's this guy saying? Or he's not one of us. And so I was wearing Vibrams in the beginning of when I switched over and people like, what the <laughs> fuck are you doing wearing those shoes? You know? And, and, and my numbers went way down in the beginning. Like we did three months pure rebuild, but I would say the rebuild phase was six to nine months. And in that process, we would try different things. And, and w- so like, um, wait, what was your question again, Callan? Specifically, uh, was, was the recovery specific yeah, or was it? Or was, it, was yeah. it intuitive, a mix of both? And like, you know, say he had a program design where it's like, I'm meant to train today and rest tomorrow. But sometimes you hit those weeks and you're like, I know I'm meant to train today, but I don't feel like I should. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what he would do for me is, because uh, I respond really well to structure. And then there was also plenty of freedom within framework, but in that first phase of the rebuilding phase, it was um, just more recovery stuff, more tonic system training. Uh, but when we started really getting into hard training, let's say, that that seven-day heart rate average and the metrics that we were using, so that would be like the first sheet that he and I would review. So the tr- the his training readiness assessment, or daily readiness assessment as he called it. And so the big teller, like I wasn't wearing any tech no aura ring, no whoop, nothing like that. So every day upon waking, I would check my pulse for a minute and then I would record that immediately upon waking. And then what he would have me do is we would take a seven day average. So let's say, you know, there's going to be fluctuations on each day, but let's just say at the end of seven days, my morning heart rate was, uh, I'm just going to throw out an easy note, 50 beats per minute was the average of seven days. 
on day eight for that next week, so let's say I've got my average of seven days, then it's Monday, then I would continually be comparing to um, above or how many beats above or below was I in the prior week's average. So what he did was he basically said, if you are um, one to two beats over average, like if you're under average, great, fucking get after it, green light. But he would say one to two beats over average, it's like clear skies. Like get after it, fucking push it. Three beats over average, it's kind of cloudy skies. Like maybe you want to start reducing your volume by one set or just start really, you know, working in, doing the self-care. Once you're four beats over average, then we would modify the training volume usually 50%. We would always keep intensity high. So that would be, we would always keep the load lifted high, but we would reduce the volume. So that would be one way so I can keep training. And then I would double down more on working in. If it was five beats or over average, what he said in all of his career was if someone didn't start taking ownership of whatever's going on, because in that long of a stretch of training and working the system, I was able to see massive jumps you know, 10, 15 beat above average when I would eat something I'm sensitive to, when I would get into a fight with a family member, like to see the mental, emotional, nutritional, all of these insults mm. and see once you have like this big, like now there's the whoop that tracks it, but to have his coaching mm. throughout Fuck and yeah. like see that shit work, especially back then it was like, whoa. So if it was five <laughs> beats or over, he would say if someone wasn't taking ownership or wasn't managing themselves, what he would say is within 72 hours, they would get sick, like catch a cold and get, you know, something. And that happened, not a ton, but that happened enough times to test it. So that was like the structured approach. But then even in his training, um, I mean, he would even write in my program design, like unbound, like <laughs> this is how structured I was. Like he would need to actually write in the program design play, like unbound play, like go fucking like do something like no structure, no objective to win, like go do Sick. something. And then he would have me, um, this is super kind of uh, not awkward, but embarrassing. He would have me go to the local pool and in part, he would just say, set the clock for 20 minutes and just wiggle your body. Or he would prefer me getting in the ocean, but the ocean here is pretty rough. Like, yeah, like, like Mavericks, like pretty, yeah, it's yeah. like a cliff and it's like, insane so i'd have to be really careful and it's freezing which is fine but it was just more dangerous and mm -hmm. i'm not a, not a great swimmer to be honest yeah. so i'd usually stick with a pool and get in the ocean when i can uh with the salt water benefits but he would just have me wiggle everything and not swim laps but just play move and just decompress and get out of those patterns and then he would also he told me to buy a, you guys familiar with aqua joggers no, nah, no. Nah. Like with the with the old, like just type it in. You guys will fucking die. <laughs> it's like what what older people wear to keep them afloat. So they'll have like oh, awkward, like these um these blue not like styrofoam but these blue uh, whatever material that you can wrap around your arms, around oh, your I waist. Think I know what they are. Yeah. Just yeah. So Sick. I would just wear like an elderly aqua jogger pelvic girdle thing. And just move in the water. That's cool. And so he would write sh shit like that. Um, you know, it was really cool that I think you guys will appreciate. So with the working in component, because that was a big, like I'd done a little bit, but being yeah. with him, like that was a huge thing. So what we ended up doing, which really with my psychology worked really well. And that was one of the things as well to your question earlier, Jake, like what was the big takeaways? One really big one was how he met me where I was at and my psychology mm. because I saw in two and a half years and even just being friends with him now for quite a while he's still him like he's still brutally honest and one of the most loving guys I've ever met and he just really knows how to I would say he's still fully him but he also really knows how to tap into the client psychology mm. so he really knew how um just my mindset worked. And, and so we did, for example, we would start with breathing squats for 20 minutes and we would modify, uh, you know, the range of motion based off of staying in the working in zones and the parameters that he would have no sweating, tongue stays moist, heart rate, all that stuff, respiratory rate can't elevate. Mm -hmm. But then he would have me progress into super light, um, I don't know if in the beginning it was eight kilos or if it was even lighter, like a four kilo bell. 
and we would do single arm swings into an overhead position so there'd be a moment of rest and we would start first with breathing squat able to get to like a 20 minute thing and stay in the working in zone and then we would start with single arm swings and I could alternate at different points but if I noticed myself going into the working out capacity I would set the bell down and go back to breathing squats and over a time period I was able to get to I believe it was 12 kilos for 20 minutes of swings into the overhead while staying completely working in. Wow. So, but that real, that was like, you know, a year and a half to two year journey. So I would use stuff like that as a way to like, keep me like tap my competitive side, but also gave me a framework like, you know, you can't get into this because then you're not doing the intended goal. So modify. And so to your, it's a long way of saying, um, some of it was structured, but then also within the training program, he definitely empowered me with ways to adjust and adapt based off of what I was feeling that day. Uh, and if I needed feedback or whatever, I didn't know, I just put in my Google Doc and, and I would just shoot him a text like, hey, Paul, like this stuff's going on. I don't really know what to do. And then he would get back. That was another thing that I learned. As busy as that man is, and he is one of the busiest people I've ever met in my life, he is incredibly responsive with clients like mm. it is insp- the way that he works mm. and how quickly and that's been not just like a time period like i'll go through phases where like i'm still very responsive with my clients but like got an almost a two-year-old son like mm. it's just a lot going yeah, on yeah. right and that man how he approached business and showed up for me i was like wow Fuck, like, i guess that's this is why. a stand people pay yeah. him the money that he that he gets you know what i mean it's like that's inspiring it's inspiring because like if you if you are going to pay someone good money and they deliver it's like that's the word spreads and it just like it's you know that's why he's booked out all over the world yeah, <laughs> which that, is insane fuck that's really cool to hear man that's um how and also how you keeping your heart rate and tongue wet and never never really thought about that you know especially in, in trying to see how far you can push that it's almost like a like a competitiveness in working in, in some sense yeah, of like yeah. practicing. Cause surely that's going to help you when you're doing fast twitch and, and your sport in some sense, like surely it gives you that little bit of awareness of mm. like how, how calm can I do this over 10 minutes, you know? Cause that's, that's fucking hard. Like I remember in CrossFit, there was an exercise called Fran and it's, it'd take me three minutes, took me nearly four minutes and I was fucked. I was sore for like, days from a four minute workout of just doing thrusters where you just squat and lift overhead and um <laughs> so i could not imagine 10 minutes mm. of two kettlebells going hard as that's 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 as hard as it gets really isn't it yeah that's wild you he would remind me of what you just said you nailed it because that was from a competitive standpoint that was one of the things he like laid in not laid in but continually like repeated and reiterated like in competition when you're competing against someone in the platform next to you and they're going sympathetic whether it's due because they're actually there or their psychology or whatever like the ability to stay calm in that zone for longer and whether it's a psychological win or actually just the physio like just the general benefits of staying more parasympathetic for longer and so that way prolonging you know if if maybe before i would go into mental grit freaking dig and fight at minute four because my arms started pumping out get the arm in a better place train the the capacities that are developed and working in especially with this kind of this approach and it might not be till minute seven now so that was like a huge confidence builder like mm. the ability to stay in it Fuck and stay yeah. calm, stay, still stay for the most part nasal breathing as much as I could. And even when I was competing, uh, you have a scoreboard, right? You have a time frame and a scoreboard in front of each competitor to let them know where they're at and you've got judges and such. But And, and, and I do know other people doing this, so I was no means like, like the only person doing this by any means. But I really liked managing my pacing rhythm with all my sets, not just in competition, with my breathing cycles. So I would know how many breaths in the rack, how many breaths in the overhead lockout position, as well as what was the duration and the quality of that breath. And I would know exactly 
if I was five reps a minute, six reps a minute, seven reps a minute, eight reps a minute. And so taking just the inspiration of the connection with the breath. And so then really in the competition set, it was just breathe and move, breathe and move. You need to slow down. You need to conserve. Okay. I know that I need six reps, six breaths in the rack, and then I need three breaths overhead. And that's, you know, a certain number of reps per minute. So that connection to the breath ended up being like a dominant strategy and I think it served me really well. Yeah. So with, with uh, you planning, did, did you plan the movement to the breathing or the breathing to the movement? Or you were t- t- putting it all around time and reps, I guess, because you're a competitiveness. Do you know what um, I mean by that? Mm, explain it maybe a slightly so different like, way. So like say, uh, did you find your natural breathing optimal sort of what felt natural and then did you make the movement, time it to the breath or did you – tie the breaths to the movement you know what i mean oh yeah so i would i would i would start with the breath yeah okay like i i knew i knew going in minute by minute and sometimes you need to adapt and adjust if shit you know sometimes Mm. too nervous or whatever it is or you know just don't feel right that day but i would know for the first few minutes what was going to be the breathing cycle how many breaths top bottom rack overhead and then i would know if I start getting into, I would try to maintain that as long as possible. But what I really found in kettlebell sport um, is, I mean, everyone's got their own strategy to this. This isn't what Paul shared with me, but this is what I found to work well with me is like, I don't like going. So if you have a 10 minute long set, every minute is its own mini competition, Mm -hmm. right? And so where my head's at, where my breathing's at, what things are feeling is different minute to minute. And what I would find is I don't like Like I wouldn't do, let's say, so let's say uh, my goal is 50 reps at the end of a 10 minute. Like I would either keep a five minute pace throughout or I would start conservative, let myself settle in, like let me get into a groove and then I would try to go up, you know, I might maintain for the first six minutes, then minute seven, let's do one above, six reps a minute, then minute eight. And I really wanted to keep my energy so I could sprint at the end. Some people might do, like five, like kind of like a pyramid, like five, then six, then four. Then, but that mm. was just too much variance and mm. too much to think about. So I would just try to keep it as rhythmic as possible, just like a metronome. And I would train with a metronome sometimes. And it was just like, hit the rep, <laughs> hit the rep, hit the rep, hit the rep. And so that was because we would do a lot of um, cluster training in our work. So like a lot of clean and jerk where you do, let's say he would put... Um, a 10 or a 20 minute clock on and we would do clean and jerks for, you know, uh, with whatever the weight would be. Um, and if I could get five reps at a heavier weight, like double 48 kilos, I would do five reps of that. And then he would have me rest as quickly as possible, but try to match those reps again mm-hmm. and to see how many clusters I could get in the time frame with the goal of not dropping two, if I recall, like two reps below what I could sustain. So there was a lot of opportunities to practice like staying in a cadence, staying in a rhythm. Uh, because even though it's a strength sport, it's more of a strength endurance, endurance sport, like 10 minutes. Yeah. Like even though it's heavy, it's more endurance than it is strength. So like that hmm. rhythmic nature was really important. In regards to nutrition for that man, did you have to like really carb load before an event? And what did that look like for you? Like what was your optimal nutrition say right before your, your comp that you felt good with? So great question. So, and I remember asking Paul this, um, and his answer would like not surprise me, but <laughs> to be honest, like sometimes like uh, not irritate, but just like, oh man, I wanted, wanted more from, you know, mm-hmm. and he's like, just ask your soul. I'm like, <laughs> ask your soul. I'm like, well, <laughs> that means I have to have that, you know, connection yeah. and, mm-hmm. Uh, and I, yeah, so, um, (laughs) my nutrition was, um, I mean, nothing honestly, super, like super crazy, like just hundred percent organic, you know, uh, as much farm to table food as I could. Um, yeah, I'm a polar type in his system. So I just know I do way better. Even the only times, like when we would get into more metabolic conditioning, I would just naturally increase my carb intake. So it might alternate between, it was typically always more protein and fat heavy. Uh, I responded really well to that. 
with sometimes in the post training window having some additional carbohydrates, but it was very much an intuitive eating process Mm -hmm. and just letting like the numbers tell. So like as all of those things, so that's what it was. It was more like test, apply, retest. Like if I wasn't recovering or if I wasn't like, then okay. You said, you say tweak, tweak things a bit, add more here at, but it wasn't like a, it was like a, uh, freedom within framework plan. So it was in his primal patterns. And then I would just know, like, I would just, uh, I think Jake, you said, um, and this was such a big learning lesson for me. Like I never had a process goal. Never. It was only like, unless I won, that was mm-hmm. it. And so when he was like, you, <laughs> you need to start, they didn't say it like this, but you need to start celebrating the process, bro. Like <laughs> you need. And so I was like, okay, well, how can I do that? I don't even, I can't even connect to that. Like, mm. if I don't win. What? What's the point? So it, it was like a big. Um, it was a really pivotal moment for me just to like relook at my whole relationship to competing and athletics. And so one of the things was is like I loved. I had um, a client for years who was a really good kettlebell competitor. She would come over and we would train. We would do our both of our sessions early in the morning. She was a great baker, like great. So she would come in with like the best, you know organic, gluten-free, all that stuff, but like banana bread and cookies. And so we would start the training session. She would bake it and I'd have some protein already like prepped. And then afterwards we would just celebrate with like food, banana bread. And it was just such a cool thing. And then to share it with a client slash friend, like a deep, you know, deep friendship with her. Um, So it was really just tracking the numbers, seeing how I was recovering and then modifying as needed. But there was never a caloric target, never a macronutrient target. It was like, here's the plan and let's see how it works and we can adjust as we go. That's pretty cool, man. That helps take away all that stress and so you can put more that energy and focus on the actual craft. I Mm -hmm. I, I saw a video from him years ago. I watched it recently where it's on YouTube and it's how to, how to eat around your training. And it was really cool. He was basically saying, you know, he'll have his normal serving of carbs, whether that's a piece of fruit. And then he goes, you usually, like you just double, like say you do a big workout, you just have like two pieces of fruit instead Mm. of, instead of your usual one. Mm. Right. And then he goes, and then when you eat, take note of eating till you're not full, but just till you're not hungry. And, and he goes, you can have the same plate there of all organic good shit, but if you eat too much, your energy will dip afterwards. So he goes, just take note mm. of how when you chew your food and when it's you're having a, a normal amount that your body isn't saying stop to, you'll have more energy no matter how good the food is. Because, mm. you know, eventually it's a poison, right? If you have too yeah, much of something. Fully. And I was like, fuck, that's how obvious is that? I know, I know. <laughs> I know. It's slowing down and then like like you said, enjoying the journey of even eating yeah. or even drinking your water or, or whatever. It's fucking, there's levels to it, hey. Yeah. But what I really wanted to touch on with you, man, while we're here is because people like we talked about a little bit in austin but people think of you as the uh well i don't know if they think of you as this but i certainly did as the kettlebell guy who was like a world champion and what's been really cool for me to witness is like how you're really stepping stepping into like more of like a shaman type uh men's Mm. group um wise man now like how, how did that come about and like was that something that just like you connected with your soul and you felt this pull towards um you know, help, helping men or like, how did, how did that become about? Yeah. For me, I started resenting that label of being known as the, whatever people like, even, you know, part of how people know anybody is, yeah, whatever, pretty much what they put on their bio. Like you <laughs> yeah. could be introduced. What I totally. realized is like, you can really, I mean, it'd be, it'd kind of be bullshit if it wasn't it, not kind of, it would be bullshit if it wasn't true. Yeah. But Today, like if you want to be known as a specific guy and you get on a podcast and you can speak halfway well, you just give them the bio. Like mm. yeah, you can yeah. really call yourself a facilitator of men's work. And tomorrow, if you that's are. the only place, <laughs> like there you are, you know, hopefully the truth will come out. But yeah, um, I started resenting that. Like I really, it's been a, it's been a journey for me to, um, because I just realized like nobody wants to be labeled. Like, or at least I don't like, mm. cause I realized like, oh, he's the kettlebell guy. And then I was like, wait, but there's so many other parts to me. Like, yeah, fully. Fuck. Like, uh, and, and I just, I was at a point where I had just done so much coaching and so much competing that I was like, 
uh, my interest is there and in other areas. And it just stopped. Um, there was a point where, like, I, st again, started resenting that title and, and being known as a movement-only coach. And so I ended up swinging, like, in the complete opposite direction. So I stopped putting out movement content or it'd be rare. I wouldn't accept podcast. I was like really in this phase of like wanting to uh, shift that. I didn't know exactly what it was, but I knew that primarily doing that type of work just wasn't really nourishing me, even though I was doing some of this work on the side. So, um, you know, with Paul, I mean, he was definitely an influence in it because I was very against any type of, plant medicine, even can you know, cannabis, anything, tobacco. And then I was seeing in the whole time with him, his relationship to this stuff and what he was doing with it and like how healing this could be. And it opened my mind a lot. And, um, and then the community here in the Bay area, I don't want to say it's like Austin, but there's a, there's a really good kind of open-minded community. And there was a float center close by that sponsored me. And in that space, it really connected me not only with the owners who are dear friends and they're, they're, they're um, medicine practitioners, I guess you could say. They serve medicine and they're just amazing. And they connected me a lot and they introduced me to Combo, um, which is a, you guys might be familiar with it, but venom. it's a frog medicine. Yeah. So I, they had introduced me to that. I got incredible results and then went down the path of serving that. And I was serving it at different retreats. And so that was, uh, I was probably like, I went into that like six years ago, more or less, something like that, six and a half years, yeah, six-ish years ago. So I was doing that, so I was doing more of the deeper work um, on myself and then supporting others, and then my wife now encouraged me, but it all kind of came together when I just got fed up. I was <laughs> like, like, I'm fucking, I don't know what's next, I don't know, all I know is I need some space. So there's a place called uh, Bonnie Dune, which is like a, a little neighborhood-ish of Santa Cruz. It's a really cool spot. Surfing town, like all organic food, bunch of hippies. And so <laughs> I, I got this super humble cabin in like the woods. And I stayed for three days, three-ish days. And my only goal was to allow myself to dream and to see and just ask the question. Like I asked it in this way. It's like, what the fuck do you want? And then sit. What the fuck do you want, Mike? And sit. And so I just did a ton of meditation, sit, journaled. And what finally came through was three things. One, I wanted to um, learn the shamanic drum. But I was like, as a white guy, like, you shouldn't be doing that. All the stories, I was like, well, fuck it. Just There's no harm in just saying that's something that you want. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The shamanic drum uh, I wanted to learn Mongolian throat singing because I always love Mongolian throat singing. And the third was, is I'm going to fucking lead some men's work. Like I'm going to, I've been, you know, supporting these containers. And I do think, uh, cause men's work is just a, such a big word. Like it can look, there's a million different forms of quote men's work. What does that even mean? But I was like, I'm just going to do it my way and see what happens. And I'm going to take that leap. So on that trip, I registered for three online shamanic drumming courses, canceled two of them. And one of them connected me with the gentleman. He's a shaman out in the UK who's the first guest on my podcast, still an amazing influence. He's, fuck, his name is Yaakov Darling Khan. If you guys check out any of his work, cool. his whole, his brand is movement medicine. So it's not plant medicine based, but it uses dance and movement. He's done a lot, like, dude's just incredible. So yeah. I learned the shamanic drum through him, did a lot of work, a fair bit of work with him. And then uh, took a year's worth of every week Mongolian throat singing classes and <laughs> lessons. Uh, and then uh, and then the men's work, I said, fuck it. And I had a client who had a farm and a really big farm out in Mount Shasta, which is the root chakra point of the world. And she just asked me, she's like, hey, you want to run a retreat in our place? And I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> let's do it. So it was that trip of like space of just just saying what do you want and sitting in that until something came through and um those three things the shamanic drum the throat singing and the men's work are really like such a massive part of what i do uh today and so now first it was like resenting and like wanting to push that away 
and now I'm just getting back more back to like my brand's men of movement. So we fucking, we move, we get after it. And there is that blend of like the inner and the outer work. So, um, yeah. That's and then my wife's been a huge man. support as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Man. Yeah. A lot Thank of people you. don't know, but your wife's like crazy at cooking and creating. Hey, she's like an artist. Yeah. That's fucking awesome, man. I feel like that's, that's the true embodiment of, uh, like ma- ma- masculine and feminine energy. You know, you got the inner world, inner soul, and then you've got the the movement as well, which is something that we don't really. Well, growing up here, we never really had that. Eh? It, was, it was more like just movement and just mm. get on with it. Mm. And then <laughs> yeah, there was no there was no touch to any. Didn't even hear about the word meditation, you know. Yeah, and and that actually goes mm. to my next question, man. What what does meditation look like for you? What do you mm. have a a structured way because I know you like structure a structured way of meditating do you have a, <laughs> a daily routine or or when you do want to tap in how do you do that so what I've realized just in the last I don't know two years that my daily practice which is some combination of movement breath meditation sometimes there's no movement it's like a static position but movement breath meditation is hands down more important to me than any hard physical movement like routine or training in the gym, like everything that I do or damn near everything. I know it's a big claim, but vast majority of everything that I do, how I show up as a papa, how I show up as a husband, my ability to stay grounded and, and, and there with my clients, my own mental, emotional state, everything hinges on that daily practice. And so, yeah, it's super structured. Um, now I've got, uh, I've got, I'm in a few men's groups, like one, some I assist to some I lead uh, I've got one or two just for myself. And one of the things that we do, this one that I'm thinking us, us four guys, uh, and they're all over, there are a few of them are, uh, one's in Germany, one's in Texas. And then I don't even know this one guy's, one of my homies is moving, but I'm in Cali. And um, we have a commitment. Like we have uh, like old school men's work. We have a commitment that we, we're, we're all either on the same practice or we're, we have clearly defined, we meet twice a month. We all have a specific movement meditation like a depth practice like a real practice and i'll share what mine is right now but if we miss one day and every day we're on whatsapp we just put like every time we meet like day one out of 14 we put one out of 14 two out of 14 and like every day we're on there and we've been doing this for months if any of us miss we've got some type of collateral so for me if i miss one day uh it's three months no coffee and each guy's got something that like if it was one month, that would kind of hurt, but that would, I would like, yeah. I, it's like, no, three months. Like, yeah, I don't want to be one. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So each guy has their own thing that hurts. And, uh, we haven't missed a day in months. I don't know. Uh, since we started this, this one in June, July, August, September, October. Yeah. So four and a half, five months, we haven't missed a day. And, my practice, it'll change, um, but I'll typically do th- at least two weeks of the same practice just so I can get deeper and deeper into it. But the one that I'm doing now that's still one of my top three is, um, it's a fairly common one, but it's called a chi generator. And basically you stand in horse stance at whatever level or depth that you want. So a wide stance, knees bent, good posture. And then your hands are up as if you're holding a beach ball. Right. So you're holding that position and that posture. And usually I'll have like an audio of my teacher guiding that through it. Sometimes I do it quiet. Sometimes I do it with movement. But the goal is to, and this is really where it's like a beautiful masculine and feminine practice. So I'll hold it, you know, it's anywhere from 10 to 18 minutes, you know. So really hard, especially as it gets harder, I'll squat down Mm. even deeper. But the whole goal, and then there's different breathing rhythms that I'll do, but one is you inhale a super silent, soft, relaxed through the nose, and then the exhale is through pursed lips. It's still relaxed, but it's... So you're repeating that breath cycle. Both are relaxed. The exhale is cleansing, clearing, tonifying. The inhale is more opening and enlivening. And so the whole practice is, is usually amount in minute three to five, it starts burning. Like it starts getting mm. quite hard. And mm. then all the thoughts. So if the masculine is the container, the ability to hold, right? Stillness, consciousness, whatever. And then all of the thoughts, feelings like, oh, fuck, this hurts. Goddamn, when's this going to be over? 
oh man, this burns. <laughs> like, when is he going to shut up, you know, with the, with the audio? Like, all of that is my own feminine. And so the practice is, so as like that, that moment there, that threshold, when it starts getting really hard, there's multiple different ways that I'll work with it. But one is just in that moment of pain, discomfort, damn, I wish this would end, when I want to collapse, can I choose joy? Can I actually train my nervous system and my body to open my heart even amidst when every part of me wants to collapse? And so that's that's one, one direction for the practice to stay in that. Like, oh, fuck, this hurts. Like, no, open more into it. Open more into it. And then with all the practices, so there's always a tough, not always, there's usually a tough physical component, a breath component, and then some thing that I'm meeting within it. Because then there's, you have the practice, which is the posture, the technical shit. But then there's always, as one of my mentors would say, there's always a practice underneath the practice. And so the practice underneath the practice is our relationship to it. Because more than likely, that is also mirroring or showing up in daily life. So with if I'm in a, a challenging conversation with my wife, how much of me wants to shut down, like my pattern is to withdraw, mm. to like get quiet, to internalize. There's a whole storm going on inside, mm. but I'm like straight faced, not going to show emotion and I will withdraw and I will collapse. I will collapse my heart. I won't engage. And that what shows up day in and day out in that practice is exactly what it's training me for and shows up in my daily life. So that way, when I'm in that conversation, it's like, hold the fucking pose, mm -hmm. stay there, but don't just pop out, like stay there and choose to be here like that. So the practices all have a different intention, but that's really what it's strengthening. It's strengthening the capacity to hold more of me, of my feminine, of her feminine, um, and then whatever else is coming up. So that's like right now, it'll be 10 to 18-ish minutes more or less. And it's a practice of relaxing into it and um, opening, opening amidst the discomfort, amidst the fear, like opening wider than it is, is a big theme of it. Fuck, that's pretty cool, man. It's inspiring, eh? Yeah, it is. And that's, <laughs> that's, I feel like what you just said, then that uh, relates to me. That was my, probably still is, you know, but I'm more conscious of it now. My pattern in any sort of emotional relationship, I'd do the same thing. If you feel something, I'd be like, all right, I'm out of here. <laughs> still feeling it, but you won't know it, you yeah. know? Um, and is there something, I like to ask this too, something with your meditative practices that you've taken from meditating that you're like, oh, that was a big realization that really impacted the whole uh direction of my life or whether that could be the direction of my life in regards to goals or what you were unconsciously choosing or whatever that may be. Mm. I think one would be the takeaway that I just shared, right? Like that, that whole capacity and like the ability to really choose, like not bullshit, like to really choose joy, like in some of these things. And there's different, different ways. So another, there's probably two other big takeaways that come up. One is just the lesson of pausing. And it sounds super simple, but just to pause and do nothing. Like when I think about that time in that cabin, for example, like I think the masculine in all of us, like there's a difference between loneliness and solitude. Like I would say in eight out of nine conversations, discovery calls or what guys show up in the events or in one-on-one -on -one coaching, most of them are saying they feel isolated, alone, lonely, some texture of that, right? And there's a very difference between loneliness and solitude. One is not connected and one is connected to self and to others. And so for me, the meditation has been a big win. And Paul, it started with Paul a moving meditation, a working in. So if he asked me to sit still back then, I don't <laughs> think I would, maybe, I would have given it a shot, but the fact that he gave me moving meditations was my window into it. Um, but I would just say the, the value and the medicine in the pause and in the space, because when I was in that cabin, just just sitting my ass still and I'm just going to sit here. <laughs> like think about a vision quest. Like in a vision quest, you're crying out for a vision depending on what tradition you do, you're sitting on a mountain 
not doing anything. And then depending how strict it is, sometimes you can't move from like a prayer circle and you just sit no matter how uncomfortable you are. And you are pausing and also noticing how much life movement wisdom is happening around you. So I would say one of the biggest things is uh, the power in the pause to like, especially because I go a lot and that's also how I can get really in trouble. It's like a superpower, Mm -hmm. but it's also like a big blind spot and has been. Uh, And even right now in life, uh, it's so interesting because this is one of the first times that I can recall, or maybe one of the few times that I feel a strong intuitive calling and there's been some crazy shit that's happened because of it (laughs) or in relation to it that I'm like normally when I take the space and pause it typically comes after some phase of like burnout I'm exhausted I'm working too late or you know too late too long or whatever it is and so then I'll be like oh the pain teacher comes and then I need to adjust and fine-tune and that's like been the pattern (laughs) in so many different ways but two weeks before this last retreat we just had I have, so we booked the retreats two years, or not two years, a year in advance because the venue books up. And I already have the deposit for the May retreat paid, done, like, because I have to, if I want to keep the spot. And I was telling my wife, I was like, I don't know what this is, but like, and when I say I'm going to do something, like, I will kill myself if I, <laughs> like, the, like, my word as much as I can. Like, if I'm out of integrity with my word mm. and I'm not perfect by any means, it just causes me a lot of stress. So like, yeah. that's a big, a big thing for me. And, um, and I was like, the May retreats and no, like, I know we paid, I know it's been months. I know like, and I was like, it's just, no, I don't know what it is, but I just need space and, um, I'm not burned out. Nothing. It's just like, I don't know what the space is supposed to be created for, whether it's time for me and her, which is definitely needed but time for us or another professional thing or something. And so I called the venue owner. I was like, look, like I know I booked this thing months ago. And I was like, but my guts tell me no, if you need to take, you know, the, the, the deposit and, you know, and take it, which was like a first night, which is not a cheap amount. It's like pay for the first night mm-hmm. of like an 18 person retreat. So it's mm-hmm. not cheap. Right. And I was like, you just do what you got to do. And he was super understanding. He's like, no, man, we'll just move that deposit to the October and you're good. And then I don't want to go to what's all on topic, but some amazing fucking things have happened and come in. And I'm just like, I don't know where this stuff came from, but going back to your question, Mm Callan, of just the pause and the space and the unmerging from the, like creating pattern breaks. Like meditation is largely a pattern break for me. Um, And then I try to bring that message into the rest of the day or in that, that vibe or that state. But, um, yeah, those are the, the, you know, those are some of the, the, the big things. There's a few others, but the pause man is like, mm-hmm. I really need it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do, you, do you get the feeling as though, like you just, you just feel so where you're meant to be in life. Like you could be out thinking about all this stuff and you come back to center and you're like, I'm right where I need to be. And it's this feeling of like this inner feeling of just like everything is perfect. There's no material it's just like you're centered. I don't know. Like that's a, that's the feeling I get when you get to that point, hey, of like that that meditation that really works, and it's fucking powerful, eh? And it's like it's powerful for for just for you, man. Like when I met you in uh, Austin, you had that Paul energy. You had that energy of like, oh, this guy's on his shit, you know? Like he's he's doing his meditation, and it was like that's why I put that post out when I got home. I was like, fuck, I met some really good wise men dude so you can you can tell that you're really living it and you're doing the work so really appreciate that man like this shit inspires me more than anything yeah Mm. yeah i'm sure that's that's why these podcasts are good man you just take it some people i'm like all right i gotta get sharp with my meditation you know (laughs) life's life's fucking fast yeah (laughs) and how fun is it like no yeah that's the journey that's the bit that is enjoyable yeah i know man you're like fuck yeah now i can shift you know we feel blessed because a lot of men will live their whole life of the same way they were when they were 21 mm. you know and yeah. i see it like i i used to be a mm. scaffolder so i used to be full on on work site that's 10 years full trade life and i remember at one stage i was like a bunch around a bunch of these guys and they were probably in their they were in their 40s you know i was early 20s and i was just thinking man i feel like all their dad like <laughs> <laughs> and i was a kid then like i feel like i'm like I've, the 
I feel like they're all children to me. Yeah. You know? And I was like, why? But not everyone's like that. But I was, I was, and I've said this before, but this is the moment that I realized I needed a shift was when they were, they were playing pokies on their phone, like, but like slot machines. Okay. And, um, but it wasn't even real money. So it wasn't even a gamble attached to it. It was just like a like you press the button and then these fake things happen. And then I was just like, man, there's not even a rush with this because it's not real money. You're not losing anything. You're not winning anything. You literally, there's no skill either. You're just tapping the screen like a fucking monkey getting a blueberry or something. You know what I mean? And I was just like, what is this? Like, is this is this my is this me? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. But now I realize, man, that scaffolding is the way I see the body now. I look at it like tension and compression, and and it really helped me. I reckon with uh. Mm. With understanding, hmm. we're understanding it all now. So it's funny how you can look at your your past and see the way you're built of somehow. It's like almost like a dream where we are now. It's fucking it's a trip. It's like it just happened, hey? Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah. Dude, um, if if people want to reach out to you, like what's um what's some what's a way someone can work with you, whether it be like one on one or through your courses, like we really like to yeah, promote people's courses on here because everyone we get on is fucking inspiring. So Thank you, man. Thank you, both of you guys. Like, this has been mm-hmm. super fun. And, um, yeah, man, I I am I think something you said, Jake, like, um, I just feel really good about what I'm doing and, and, and as a byproduct of getting to see not just men's life change, but also, like, their families. Like, more of the, uh, this surprised me, but, more of the thank yous have even come from the wives and like girlfriends. Like, yo, when Jason came back, like he's showing up completely different for our son completely. And it's like, damn. So like the work that I'm doing right now more than any other time. And it's really the integration of the strength and conditioning stuff that I love and then making it meet like we can be physical badasses. Like I want to be like, yeah, yeah. like I want to right now. I'm in like, I haven't been in a hypertrophy phase in years, <laughs> years. And I'm like, yeah, I want to fucking embody some more size right now. Like I'm going to own yeah. that. Like that's going to feel good. Mm. I want a bigger neck. Like I want to fucking like, you know, <laughs> yeah. pit bull neck. And like, I'm going to breathe. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to like, you know, hold space for my lady and just love on her and appreciate her. And so um, if anybody at any level, whether it's one-on-one or online programs or group, whatever it is on the physical side or anything else. Uh, Instagram is a great place. Uh, it's at Mike.Salemi, S-A-L-E-M-I. Um, my email is Mike at MikeSalemi.io, not .com. Uh, just send me an email there. My website is MikeSalemi.io. Um, and right now I'm doing all the communication. So you'll basically get in touch with me directly. So at any level, hop on a call. Paul would love to chat and um and I also have a podcast as well the path with Mike Salemi so all of those are fair game and anything that I can do um I'm fucking I'm in I'm in fuck, fuck that's sick eh? one thing man I didn't tell you when I was over there is like when I signed up for your kettlebell course and I did it um you sent me a video message um mm. and I was like fuck that was sick dude that just it made my day <laughs> dude I was just like He's actually seen it and he's just, and he's pumped that I've got his course. And yeah. he's like, I was just like, it True. made the world of difference. Eh? Yeah. Like, I just felt well, like, oh, this is, you know, it fucking made a huge difference for me. And I went so, through that course and loved it. Yeah. Something so simple. And you know what I realized, man, I've been doing that lately with um, DMs because I realized I wasn't getting to, there's so many fucking DMs, like even on my own personal one with people with body issues. Mm. And I just can't, I just hate sitting there and typing. Mm. And I realized, why haven't I just been voice recording, answering yeah. all these people? I can be, I could be yeah, sitting on the quickly, fucking toilet, yeah. man, and yeah. just answering shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, and and being more present, you know, I yeah. get more words out, and I was like, all right, that's that's a a tip, hey. That's a like you said, then that's yeah. a reminder for me. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, dude. And um, yeah, in in the future, man, we'd love like if you ever thinking about coming out to Oz, we'd love to host an event or something like a men's group out here, or we've yeah. got a beautiful place on the water, and yeah, whatever you need out here, man, we got you sorted. But yeah, for sure, it'd be amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That would be so freaking rad. It That's would, a full eh? yes. Yeah. So that would be super rad. I'd love to do that. Yeah. Awesome. Love man. to do that. Thank you guys. Shit, yeah. Well, right. thank, thank you for your time today, bro. 